time, let's all stand. Brother Austin and Brother Roberts, if y'all could come again. Brother Troyer, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Yeah, thank y'all. Let's all stand. Two hundred twenty-nine for our next song. Since I have been redeemed. Two hundred twenty-nine. Let's do all four verses of this one as well. Two hundred twenty-nine. So I've not seen them yet. We appreciate y'all being here. Um, really appreciate y'all. Thank you for the same person. Oh, my, he came 
appreciate this man. I appreciate his testimony. It's good to meet you, Brother Lewis. Can you come and preach for us? Amen. 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 Well, if you're happy to say it, can you say amen? Amen. 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 Boy, it's great to be in the house of the Lord this morning. <laughs> amen. Good to see the Maple family. Amen. Amen. My goodness, I haven't seen them for a number of years. <laughs> and it's certainly good to see them. Thank you so much for having this fellowship with you. And preacher, thank you for inviting me. Preacher, thank you so, so much. I do appreciate that. I probably would be my good friend, Pastor Kearns. Pastors in the same town. Amen. Like Amen. Another fundamental independent Baptist church. Amen. That's unusual. Yeah. Same town. I mean, we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> we don't even talk about each other. We, we love one another. Amen. We have a lot of fellowship. And he prays for me and I pray for him. Amen. And he has a church over across town. I have a church across the other, other side of town. Only 6,000 people, so it's a small town. Everybody knows everybody. Amen. You can see Brother Bickelhoff. That's a friend of mine as well. Amen. Oak Harbor, Ohio. And uh, good to see him as well today. And I smelled the food when I walked in. Uh -huh. I thought, I got to preach just before we eat. Yeah. <laughs> and I know people get really itchy <laughs> when it's time to eat. But let me give you some word of God this morning that will encourage you. My whole plan today was simply this. Come and have a good time with you and have a wonderful fellowship. And try to give you something that would encourage you and take that word back to encourage your people. Amen. Uh, I love fellowship meetings that do that sort of thing. Amen. That they encourage us to be in the work. Amen. Amen. And do something for God and have a touch of God while we're doing it. Amen. It'd be great if we just had a bunch of preachers just come up and pray and ask God to help us after the service is over. God, give us wisdom and use us. By the way, the Rogers family, Mark Rogers. Yeah. I met Mark Rogers before he ever got married yeah. and before he ever had all these kids. Yeah. Amen. And, uh, I was up in Fairbanks, Alaska. Right, right preacher? Yeah, I was up there preaching uh, some services in uh, Alaska. And the very one was playing the piano, still playing the piano, singing away. And Amen. He was single. Mm -hmm. And I thought, 
That's the guy that ought to marry my daughter. <laughs> I did, I did. I mean, I'm just being honest. I said to myself, that man needs to meet my man. My daughter's a beautiful young lady. And what does Mark Rogers do? Next thing I hear, he's burying a blonde. <laughs> Oh, it's good to see you folks. God bless you. You guys do an awesome job of singing, and I just appreciate you so much. It's just great to know you and to know God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. I just want to be used today. God, I've asked you already to touch my mind and my heart. And I pray that you bless this group of preachers and their wives and family and friends. And bless our church here. We love Mother Mrs. Maple. And their family, please bless this place. We thank you for all that you do. Now challenge our hearts today. Give us wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you get your Bibles and just kind of keep them handy? Uh, I'm not going to have a Bible search or anything like that, but boy, I love to use the Scripture. Uh, that's what we're here for, to use the Word of God. Amen. And uh, I want you to turn with me when I turn the verses of Scripture. Now, in saying that, it might take us a little longer getting through the message. So, you know, help me out, turn quickly. We'll read the verse, then we'll go on. Lunch is just around the corner. Here's my, here's my question. I get asked this all the time. I, I have pastored the Harvest Baptist Temple in Clyde, Ohio for 44 years. Amen. It's a tremendous ministry and it's still going so very well. Amen. On Sunday morning, the church auditorium seats right around 450, 500, and it's full. Amen. It is, it is unbelievable what God is doing there. Amen. But God is so good. In those 44 years, I retired seven years ago. So I just been preaching different churches. Uh, interning at some churches. And it's just been a, a good thing for my wife and I. It's been a wonderful blessing. And I love the ministry. Amen. I love pastoring. I love churches. Amen. I love preachers. Amen. I just love the whole thing that God has called us into. Amen. But there's been a question that's been asked of me many, many times, and it's this. Is change really possible? Hmm. Now think about it. They asked me all the time when I was pastoring. But pastor is change. Really possible. We see people come and they kneel and they get right with God supposedly. And then in a short period of time, something happens and all of a sudden they're gone. We say, well, they change. And then all of a sudden they change again. Hmm. What's happening? Uh, Pastor, we got to ask a question. Is it really possible? Is change really possible? And then the other question that came to me quite often is it really possible to be like Jesus? You know, all of your preachers and all of your church leading and all that sort of thing, they're teaching everybody you can be just like Jesus. And yet, preacher, we're not like Jesus. And you know it. And sometimes some of the meanest people are Christians. Some of the meanest people who don't have any understanding or any patience is Christians. Is it possible to be like Jesus? When I was a kid growing up, my mother had a song that she liked. My mom and dad were both Christian people. I surrendered to my life to the Lord when I was 13. Amen. Mother Maple, I gotta tell you something. I don't know about everybody else, but I know at age 13, sister, something happened to me. Hey, Amen. I mean, it, it did. I, I, don't, I don't even understand it all today, but I'm telling you something happened. Amen. Amen. And all this stuff that I keep hearing about wanting to go back into sin and, and wanting to live like the world, I cannot get that in my mind. I don't want to do anything like that. Something happened to me. Yeah. My life turned. That's right. At age 16, I preached my first message. Mm -hmm. I've been preaching ever since. Amen. I'm 77 years old today. Amen. And my mother started me out by singing 
to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. All I ask is to be like you. Amen. How many of you know that song? Let me see your hand. Come on, help me sing that, right? Just real quick. Come on, come on. Like a like a big concert. Ready? Here we go. To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all I ask is to be like you, all through life's journey, from earth to glory, all I ask is to be like you. Come on, sing it one more time. To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all I ask is to be like Him. From earth to glory, from earth to glory, all through, I can mess that up, I'm sorry. <laughs> through, all through life's journey, from earth to glory, oh, come on, sing it. Jesus is not only possible, fellas, it is the point of God's saving work. Right. Romans chapter 8. Would you get there, please? Romans chapter 8, verse number 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed. There it is, to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Amen. God's intention for your life and my life is that we are transformed into the exact image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the whole thing. Amen. Now, is that your goal today? Is that your church's goal? I want my church to be like Jesus. Amen. I want my life. To be like Jesus. Amen. That's my goal. I'm going to tell you something. As long as you believe Christ's likeness is out of reach, you will never pursue it right. with abandon. Mm -hmm. right. Being like Jesus is not only possible, it is the point of God's saving work. Roman numeral one, if you're taking a note, I want you to put down beyond willpower. Amen. This is a really good lesson to teach somebody who's struggling. Now, I'm guessing that you have tried to be like Jesus. I'm guessing that everybody here has tried to be like Jesus. In fact, if you're like me, you've tried and failed more times than you care to talk about. Sure. Uh, don't look at me so funny. <laughs> you know, you break certain laws and you, oh well, I can speak. It's okay. <laughs> I know all about you preachers. <laughs> I traveled with you. <laughs> Come on. We have failed. Take this young man that I dealt with in my office. I dealt with so much of this stuff when I was pastoring. Who looked at pornography. And he wanted to quit. And he came to talk to his preacher. And he said, preacher, I know I'm saved, but I got this problem. I got pornography problems. But I want to quit. And he did. Sometimes a week at a time. 
Sometimes two weeks. Come on, amen, you know what I'm talking about. If you're a counselor, you understand this stuff. And sometimes that young man actually quit for two months. And he had victory and everything was great. Now don't look at me a little funny this morning by, by talking about this because in our churches we are full of men and women, boys and girls who are looking at pornography. Yes, sir. Right. Right. Whether it's on the internet, whether it's on the cell phone, whether it's on the TV, I don't know where they actually get it all, but it's happening all the time. Yes, and it's not it's not just teenage boys. Right, right, right. It's teenage girls. Right. And it's not just teenagers. It's older men. I had an older man, probably 75. Now walked in my office and said, Pastor, I've been hiding this for years, but I've got to get him off my chest before I die. I gotta get some help. He was said he said, I got pornography problems. Nobody even suspicioned that. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So it's throughout the whole gamut of, of our human nature, the battle was so tough and so fierce. This young man's resistance wears thin, and he finds himself caught once again in a cycle of failure, shame, and loathing. Same matter could be said of a, of a young lady that came and was struggling with overeating. It was a simply opening, but she won a victory. What about the young man who said, Preacher, I got such an anger problem. I get so mad so quick. And I know it's wrong. It means right, it's wrong. Amen. Yeah. Then the young lady who said, Preacher, I'd like to change too. I have prescription drug problems. And there's a lot of that stuff going on right. in our day. So these four are all using common strategy for change. You know what it's called? Willpower. Um, but as strong as the human will is, willpower is a limited resource. That's right. That's right. It can only be sustained for short burst without support for more deeply rooted desires. That's why willpower can be effective for temporary change but usually proves ineffective for long term transformation. Yes. In practical terms willpower is trying really hard not to do what I find at some deeper level I really want to do. Listen, you may really want to do something, but you need to have some inside fortitude to say, I will not do it. Right. Right. In practical terms, willpower is trying really hard not to do what you find at some deeper level that you really want to do. Eventually, our desires wear down our willpower, leading to a futile cycle that looks something like the next six things. If you want to write these down, they would really be good to, to, when you're counseling. Because I've talked to so many people, and they say, you know, Pastor, I'm doing okay now. I'm doing better with temptation. Uh, so I, I'm not going to do much of anything that's wrong. I'm not going to do much of anything until the moment of my temptation. Well, you know what that leads to? That leads to trying really hard not to do what I find I don't want to do. That's the second step. And you know what that does? When I really try not to do what I find I want to do, what, what happens? Number three, I fall. I fail. I can't tell you the countless counseling sessions I've had where people say, well, I tried. I tried. I said, that's your problem. Your willpower will never get you where you want to be with God. Right. Never. After you fall, how do you feel, everybody? How does everybody feel after they fall? Okay, I tried. I, I wasn't successful. The temptation came. It, it hit me. And I tried really hard not to do what I wanted to do. I fell. How do you feel after that? Like a failure. Like a stinking failure. 
but more than that, how do you feel? Come on, give me some words. Shame. Shame. And I also feel guilty. guilty. Thank you. I feel guilty. So here's this person, whether well, it's a teenager, a man in the church. What do you think some of the men come to your church and they come and they're so bleak and they're so un upset and they don't sing and they don't worship God. They don't do anything because they're guilty of what we're talking about. Ladies the same way. Teenagers the same way. That's why they sit in the back seat and talk all the time while you're preaching. Right. They have no interest. Be why? Because I tried. My willpower didn't help me out at all. I tried my best and it didn't work. Preacher's not worth it. After I feel guilty, if I really want to overcome, what do I do next? I resolve to try harder the next time. That's exactly where we're at. Eventually, what happens? I do it again, and I get very discouraged. And I either quit, well, I fake it. Mm -hmm. We have men and women, boys and girls in our churches that are faking so much. Right. Yeah, right. Right. And some who have flat just quit. That's right. We have families who have just quit. Uh -huh. And we say, what the world is wrong? What's going on? And so much of what's happening in our society even in our churches, like our church here, right. is that we try everything by our own strength. Yeah. Yeah. It will never. Right. That's right. Right. <laughs> I have a neighbor now. This is a long time ago when I was still in Lima. I'm originally from Lima, Ohio. I got saved in Lima. But in Lima, we had a gal that lived right next door to us. And she, boy, she would come out of her trailer, and she would have very skimpy clothes on. <laughs> I mean, you could see just about anything, everything you wanted. And my wife would always, that's what would say, that's what would say, it was the middle of the day, what are you going to change? I don't want you to see what's next door. <laughs> I said, okay. I didn't see it. So my wife kept telling me, every time you go to work, she comes out, she had no clothes, hardly on her arm. And I said, hmm. then one day, she came over to borrow some eggs. <laughs> and she had a dress down to here. <laughs> she had a top up to here. And she had sleeves all covered. She had hair all fixed up. And she said, Mrs. Lewis, do you have any eggs? I said, so sure, Dana, we'll give you some eggs. She said, come on in. And she said, there. She said, well, do you notice anything? <laughs> I bet she didn't ask me that. And my wife said, well, what am I supposed to notice? Just trying to be kind. She said, you don't notice how I'm dressed? And my wife said, oh, you got a really nice dress on. Oh, you look real pretty. She said, yeah, I got saved. Yeah. Amen. 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 Because four weeks later, she had the same skimpy outfit on she had before she supposed to not be saved. So she came over. This time she had to put her hips around. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Pastor Lush, did your wife have any hands? Everything kind of showing. She said, I said, sure, just go to the door and watch you. She's there. Well, I suppose you notice. I said, notice what? <laughs> well, I didn't, I'm not saved anymore. <laughs> I said, you're not saved anymore? What happened? Well, look at me. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's willpower. It does not work. Let me tell you what does work. Surely, I think in all of our wise thinking as men and women, surely, when Jesus was talking, he had something else in mind when he told us and he promised us that we could have freedom. 
and that we could have the abundant life here Amen. as well as in eternity. I believe with all of my heart he has something different than trying to solve everything by your willpower. That's right. I believe God has something special for all of us. So let's be Roman numeral number two. Change the Jesus way. Mm -hmm. How do I change the Jesus way? According to Jesus, the battle for change is actually waged in the heart. Amen. 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 Turn to that verse of scripture, would you please, in Matthew chapter 15. Some of you men, I may have to have you read something so I can get it done quickly. Quickly, I don't want to take too much time, but I do want to get through all of this. Matthew chapter uh, number 15, verse 17 through 19. Matthew 15, 17 through 19. Let me read it very quickly. Do, do, you not, do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in the mouth, into the belly, and is cast out into the drought? Uh, but those things which proceed out of the heart, out of the mouth, come from the heart. There it is. And they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. Wow. Real transformation happens when our most dominant desires match what God desires. Until then, that willpower that we use will be a flimsy defense against the relentless, sinful passions of our flesh. In fact, go to John chapter 7 now. This, this is, a, to me, just one of the most powerful verses of Scripture. Because the good news is, is that Jesus came to do something. Jesus Christ came to change the heart of a man. Come on, amen. You can say amen. But that's a good place for an amen. amen. Jesus Christ came to change the heart of the man. Amen. And here's what he says in John chapter number 7. And you know it very, very well. Verse 37 through 39. Look at I, I just get so excited here. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of the belly shall flow rivers of living water. Your heart's going to be changed. And from the inside, as the heart is changed, Brother Hamilton, God gives you a wonderful living water. And you're a different person. Your Bible yeah. talks about that. Does it all the way through the scriptures, really? That you're a changed man. You're a new creature. On and on and on it goes. Out of my belly and out of my heart flows all this living water. This is what sets Jesus' way of changing apart from every other self-help strategy. Sure. He changes us from the inside out. Right. What we try to do is change folks when they come from the outside in. It will never work. Right. It's a bunch of willpower. Oh, you can do it. You can do it. And so we have people trying to do it. And they're failing. Right. They come to church and they're so sad because they're so disappointed in themselves. They're so guilty. Go with me to go to Colossians chapter number three. Colossians chapter number three. Verse one to five gives us a threefold pattern for how inside out change happens in our lives. I want to give you three points here and I'll be finished. Now let's read these verses because they're powerful. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections, affection on things above, not things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Look at that next word. Mortify, therefore, your members, which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Put a little dot underneath Roman number, number two. Start in the right place. If you're going to get saved, trust Christ, you start in the right place. You've got to start in the right place. And what is the right place? Verse 1. You have been risen with Christ. 
Right. Hey, hey, this is no trial period. Okay, you got saved at the altar. You came and you trusted the Lord. I will try to wait and see how long it lasts. That's not salvation. Right. Salvation comes in. What does the Holy Spirit do? He comes in at salvation. And all of a sudden, when you really get saved, there's something inside of you. It's the rivers of living water that spring up in everlasting life. And you are different. Amen. Amen. People who get up and walk out, you see them sitting in the bar the next week, they're not saved. Right, right. Oh, the pastor, they got. That's not the living waters. Mm. Cuss and swear. Right. Come on, that's not salvation. Yeah. That's right. The essence of being a Christian is not following just a moral code of conduct, although that moral code is good and must be, but it's receiving, get this, a new nature. Yeah. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 3, you don't need to turn there. What did he say? You know what he said in John 3, 3. You must be born again. Amen. That's what he said. You've got to be born again. A Christian is someone who has been united with Christ and given his life. God gave me his life when I was 13. By the power of the Holy Spirit that came inside of me, he gave me his life. Amen. I became a new creature. Amen. Amen. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Something that was dead has come alive at the core right. of our being, making us a new creation. Just like these verses now, because I know that you know them. Ephesians 2, 1 through 6. And also 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Now, why is what I'm saying right here so important? Think about this. What if my dream and I love to play sports, by the way. Now, look how tall I am. <laughs> Brother Roger, quick. Come on, big man. Sit there. Sit there. When I was a kid in high school, I played basketball. I'm tall at me. So, yeah, I'm driven. I'm driven. I'm like, look, look at my legs. You know, I'm taking one. I'm quick. But I ain't tall. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to play basketball so bad. I love I love coaching basketball. But put your hand up there, like you're gonna rock it. And you shoot over somebody like that. <laughs> I got my ball here. Look, I got the ball here. Pass me the ball, pass me the ball. Whoa. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I had a desire to play basketball. I really did. I oh Maybe someday, maybe I go to college and maybe someday, are you kidding me? I can't even touch the net. <laughs> <laughs> so we built years ago a little closet hut. We bought a little closet hut. Brother Bickhoff knows all about this. And we put a basketball gymnasium in that closet hut for a while. <clears throat> so the guys, I hate to take sides, but I got to hate the story. The guy said, hey, preacher. Have you always wanted to dunk? I said, dunk the basketball man has been a theme of my life. <laughs> I, could just, well, I, can, I can't even touch the net. I mean, five, seven and a half, five, eight, eight much. That's it. You got no more net. So they said, let's take a picture of you dunking the ball. I said, how in the world do I want to do that? They said, well, before we put it up, It'll be on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get the camera all set and have the rim up here about this high. We'll make it about this high. You grab a hold of the front of the rim like this, take the ball in your hand, and kind of lean into it, you know, like you put a dunk. Like, ah! <laughs> and, and we'll take a picture of it. So I said, oh man, that's, that'd be me. <laughs> so I had my basketball uniform on the whole bit, grabbed the rim, had to, went, ah, I had to snap the picture, and then it looked like it was real. Pastor was that high? So somebody came and said, Pastor, I didn't know you could jump so high. <laughs> Man, that picture is awesome. I said, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure why I told that story. <laughs> but here's a simple fact. I could never dunk like Michael Jordan or LeBron James. The basketball star, the NBA. I could never do that. 
Never. You know why? I don't have their DNA. Right. I'd have to have their DNA to be able to do that kind of stuff. I don't have that. I have the Lewis genes, <laughs> where it's all small. <laughs> My whole family is just small. <laughs> My wife is about this tall. <laughs> all right. I can't show you the powerful verse. Maybe I'll have a shout right here. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. I tell you, this ought to change your life. If nothing else I've, I've said, oh, this ought to change you. Seriously. The wonder <laughs> of being a new creation in Christ is that we have become, listen, I have become, you have become partakers of his divine nature. That's right. That's what it said right here in the book. Amen? In 2 Peter chapter 1, look at verse number 3 and 4. According to his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto uh, life and godliness. Look at that. Life and godliness. Through the knowledge of, of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these he might, there it is, that he might be partakers of his divine nature. Amen. Woo! You know what's happened to me since I got saved at age 13? Something came inside of me, and now it's not just me, it's the divine nature of the Holy Spirit of God that ignites me to live this Christian life. Amen. 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 Wow, you don't need anything else. Amen. What did Jesus say? Without me, you can do nothing. But oh, with him, ladies and gentlemen, don't cut yourself short. With him, you can do all things. Amen. Did he not say, all things are possible? All things are possible with him. Amen. What a God we serve. Amen. I have the DNA of Jesus has been implanted in me. We have been raised with Christ, given spiritual capacity and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that's why Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, verse 11, he says this, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to Christ, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Wow. And that's why Romans 5, 16 says, as we walk by the Spirit, we no longer fulfill, are you listening? The desires of the flesh. Amen. That's not something just mind over matter. That's because there's somebody really looking here. Amen. Amen. Right. I'm sorry. I've been through so many experiences where I wanted to jump it all. And yet the rivers of living water kept coming. Amen. Woo! Yeah. Oh, that's it for an altar. God, I'm sorry for thinking anything like that. I've got the Spirit of God in me. Amen. I can do all things through Christ. Amen. Oh, miracles are still happening. That's right. That's right. Preachers, I said miracles are still happening. Amen. Your church can grow. Your church can prosper. God can heal. God can put families together. Of course, I will say this, being alive is not the same thing as being mature. That's right. I'm a proud daddy of two kids. For the, each of those two kids, I found something out. They're so tiny. <laughs> wow. And then I found something else out. They can't do anything for themselves. That's right. Mom and I had to do everything for those babies. Now you think about that when a new convert gets saved in your church. Yeah. Don't be rough on them. Right. Love them. Amen. They can't do anything. Right. You say, we're up to 40 years old. That doesn't matter. They just got saved. Hey, love them into the kingdom. Our problem is we're not constant in loving people as God would love them. But we have the capacity to do it because it's in here. Amen. Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. Letter B, another dot. Join the battle. Look at Colossians again, chapter 3, verse 5, if you will, please. 
Colossians, if you will, please. I think it's verse 5, chapter 3. Yeah, look what it says. Mortify, or oh, it's up. What's that word mortify? Kill off. To what? Kill off. Kill off. He's right. Kill him. Mortify him. Well, now, this is serious business here. Join the battle. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Put it to death. Read what it says. Yeah. Yeah. Colossians 3 5 tells us that part of the process of maturing in Christ's likeness is putting something to death. In order to do that, that's a process of becoming like Jesus. It requires violent action from Christians. I'll tell you why. When it comes to sin, can I ask you a question? Can you look at me? Are you a killer? Pastor, you're so morbid. No, I'm asking you, are you a killer? How do you kill anything? Take it with the air, you take it with the water, you take it with the nutrients. That's how you kill things. Now we're talking about the things of God. How do you kill things? It involves cutting off air, water, nutrients. In the same way, if you want to kill a sinful practice, ladies and gentlemen, teenagers alike, you've got to quit feeding it. Yeah. All right. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. right. One of the most insightful scriptures, I think, about this process of change is found in Romans chapter 3. Would you write that down and turn to it? I mean, Romans 13, I'm sorry. Chapter 14, which simply says, and you know what it says. Let me start you out. You can quote it to me. Make no. <laughs> Say it again. Provision. provision. Make no provision for the flesh. flesh. Right. Now I told us, don't make any provision for the flesh that you can gratify the sinful desires that you have. Now I got to talk about that a little bit because make no provision for the flesh. In order to, uh, to sin habitually, now listen, this is good stuff. In order to Sin habitually, we first have to make provision in some way for that sin to take place. Yeah. Think about it. That's what you think. You have to think of a place where you can do that sin without getting caught. Amen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In regards to that, I find it amazing how that our worst behaviors never show up on Sunday morning at church. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? So when we come to church, oh, and we all get to heaven on a day of rejoicing, there will be a man, brother. Amen. Everybody's smiling. Everybody's, everybody's dressed nice. But what about those other places where you plan to sin? Oh, we try to plan that. I just fall into it. <laughs> you make provision for it. That's why the scripture says, make no provision. Right. God's smart. And he said, make no provision. I want to talk about that just a little bit more. We would never think of coming to a Sunday morning service and committing the sin of our failure in front of everyone else. I talked to a lot of people, like I told you before, about pornography. They ask him questions. Well, where do you do your pornography? Uh, my cell phone. Really? My computer. My TV. And they keep mentioning different places of technology that the old devil has kind of infiltrated. Mm -hmm. This is what I do. But where do you access that stuff? Well, my bedroom, outside the barn, 
Nobody can see me. Well, where's the computer? Cell phone? TV? That's in the house. We get there to the living room, everybody's in bed. You know, that's not killing the sin. That's right. I, I, you know, I have one of these things too. I think probably everybody has one. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen little kids have it. Uh -huh. you, know, you know what kind of filthy rot that stuff's on this thing? Mm -hmm. Do we need it? We did fine without it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did fine for years without it. I didn't have cell phone for years. Right. Yeah, everybody's kind of walking around the park. <laughs> You can't even eat with somebody without somebody looking at their cell phone. Say, it doesn't sound like that. That's right. <laughs> Put it down. Amen. Talk to me while I'm here. Amen. Amen. None of us are that important that we have to take a call right now. Uh, you're right. <laughs> I'll tell you, I, I know it's getting hard. <laughs> I did a restaurant. I saw a waiter, waitress do something I've never seen in my life. It was right downtown Fremont. It was a family that came in. Husband and wife, they sat together, their teenage daughters on the other side. As soon as they sat down, boy popped out her cell phone, she was on her cell phone. Mom and dad are sitting there talking to each other, not talking to her. She's not talking to them. She's on her cell phone. And the waitress had just had enough. Mm -hmm. She walked over. After she got their food for them, she walked over. She says, Don't kill me. Don't hang on, hang on to that second. I'm going to take it from you. Okay? She walked over. And she doesn't say anything else, but she goes. <laughs> and walks back into the kitchen. <laughs> I watched it. The girl said to go. Mom, Dad, did you see that? Did you watch that one? For a while, when we were getting ready to pay the bill, and the, the teenage girl was frustrated. I mean, she was blowing up. <laughs> It's the dumbest place to eat. That's the dumbest waitress. And she just made, you know, mom and dad didn't say one thing to her about that. Took her cell phone. Yeah. Most people would never do that. Yeah. <laughs> when left, she gave her cell phone back to the girl and said, here's what she said. Next time you come here to eat with your mother and your dad, don't do this. Amen. 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 You need to talk to your mom and your dad. Amen. Right. Amen. 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 I said, hey, man, this is a whole thing I've told you. We're going to have war. Yeah. So they left. And I, I said, <laughs> I said, you have got some guts. <laughs> and she said, Pastor, I am so sick of that. I see it all the time. I'm telling you, it makes me sick. <laughs> Amen. See, I'm going to grab every cell phone I see and put it back in the kitchen and sit home. Good luck, sis. <laughs> Isn't that amazing, though? Yeah. But it's the truth. Mm -hmm. It is the truth. Now, I'm not a rocket scientist, but what needs to be done seems to be pretty clear. The problem is that we are unwilling to go to the extreme of living without a computer or a television or a phone, or at least giving up the right to access them when we're alone. The same thing can be said about junk food. I have to admit this. I'm a junk food junkie. I said, I hope they have chocolate cake with them. <laughs> I love dessert. I can eat dessert every every meal. Well, I do most of the time. But, <laughs> but you know what I like more than anything else is ice cream. Mm -hmm. I have a good hospital. He says he came to the hospital this evening. Had open heart surgery eleven years ago. I was shoot heart taken out, and then repaired. And the first thing he said is, "Now, Ashley." Uh, you're a healthy guy, you look pretty healthy, and, you know, you seem healthy, and all your vitals are just perfect. So we're going to give you a little thing to think about. Don't eat any red meat, and don't eat any ice cream. 
I said, what did you say? <laughs> I mean, that last part. <laughs> he said, I don't think you ought to have any ice cream. I said, what's wrong with ice cream? He said, you have a fatty condition in your bloodstream. Stops your heart. He said, ice cream causes more fatty. I said, oh, man, don't tell me that. <laughs> you didn't tell my wife, did you? <laughs> she don't know no <laughs> So one of the worst things we have in our house, we cannot keep ice cream in the fridge. No. If it is, I'll eat it all up. I mean one or two helping, that's it. Go half a gallon, it's gone. So my wife said, that's it. That's so different than pornography or anything else. I mean, we shouldn't overeat like that. If it's wrong, we shouldn't do it. Amen. Hmm. Well, the common characteristics of more people serious about killing their sin becomes like to become like Jesus is they have a battle plan. Go to Matthew chapter 18. I'm just about finished, okay? Matthew chapter 18, verse 8 and 9. I put my hand or my foot offend me, cut it off. Whew! Cast them from me. It is better for me to enter into life, halt, and maim, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Wow. But I offend me one time. He cast it from me. It is better for me to enter into the life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into the fire. Now, I know we can have all kinds of comments about all that. I understand that. Well, he didn't really mean to cut him off. Didn't really mean to pluck it out. Well, you take that up with him. I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't know. I don't see anybody with cut off hands and cut off feet. Pretty tough stuff, huh? You know why he said all that? Because he wants you to understand you got to kill him. you got to kill your sin. Or it will destroy you. Yes, you're right. And you'll come and make a profession of faith and try to work your willpower, and it will not work. Right. Of course, simply cutting off access to temptation is not the same as transformation. Now, we're aiming at character like Jesus has, not a fortress. bad things. I wish we would get away in our churches mm -hmm. about always trying to tell everybody the bad things you shouldn't be doing. Now this is where I think Christians go wrong. Our strategy for being like Jesus is reduced to stopping behaviors rather than patiently pursuing Jesus Christ. Amen. We're trying to do away with bad behaviors. But we've forgotten to tell them how to fall in love with Jesus and how to love him from your heart. How to know the Holy Spirit lives in here. you got to understand what God has for us. You can be an overcomer. You can be a winner. Amen. Come on, let me run beside you so we can do this together. You saw my church. Come on, church. Follow me. I want to run. Let's go for God. Let's go for God. God sets the the pace. God sets the race. But I have to run it. Amen. The problem with making our focus not sinning is that negation is never enough to satisfy the human heart. You know why? Because we were made <laughs> we were made to be satisfied in God. Amen. Amen. I want you to know right now, I'm one of the most satisfied men you'll ever see. I don't care what anybody else has, I don't care what anybody else does. Amen. I love Jesus. Amen. I do. 
Is that what you can find? Amen. I'm satisfied. In, I don't need nothing else. That's right. I don't need a bigger house. I don't need a better car. I don't need more clothes. I just love God. I just need Jesus. Amen. God, keep me on the street. Amen. Give me the fire of God. Amen. My heart and now that's why real transformation requires that our hearts and our minds be set on Jesus. As we move toward Jesus, we move away from our sin. Oh. I want you to write this down. I want you to have a phrase. I'm, I'm done. The most powerful principle for change. Write this down as a, a little note. The most powerful principle for change. Here it is. We are changed, underline the word by, by Jesus, as we are with Jesus. Woo, boy, that will preach. Amen. We are changed by Jesus as we are with Jesus. Amen. In other words, how many times, now you know exactly what that principle is, because how many times have you said to your kids, and they ran in the neighborhood, and they started running with some kids that were just not like what you wanted them to run with? Mm -hmm. And you would say something like this, kids, you're not going to do that anymore. You're not going to run with that neighbor anymore. You're acting more and more like them all the time. Mm -hmm. Because you act who you run with. Alright. So this is the spiritual truth. I am changed by Jesus. And I spend time with Jesus. Amen. Brother Roger, I'm going to do one more thing. Brother Becker Hall, would you come? Preacher, would you come? Alright, I want to show you one thing. It's a better earth. A lot of changes make it. It's real simple. Now I'm done. Alright. Let's have uh, no, I want you to stand right there. Okay. I want you to stand over here. Uh, picture, I want you to come here. Okay, picture one. This is the world. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> this, hey, there you go. This is Jesus. Oh, <laughs> Messed up. <laughs> this is a sinner. <laughs> but he gets saved. Amen. Amen. He Amen. leaves the world. <coughs> Amen. You see, now he's a baby. <laughs> a big baby. <laughs> but he's a baby. And he's just getting to know Jesus. So he gets a little closer to Jesus. And he's doing quite well. But then something happens. Jesus is the same. Yes. 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 Jesus is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Right. Amen. The world is this far from Jesus. This man, who's a Christian, has been a change. Mm -hmm. He's come out of the world, and we were all excited. Yeah. But over the course of time, the fire of God begins to burn low, and nobody teaches them how to stir the embers of the Holy Spirit. You're saved. Stir the embers. Let the fire come back again, because the fire will burn off the dross. Mm -hmm. yeah. The fire will burn off the impurities. Right. But we don't do that. So the world is a little worse. Oh. Let's get this one. One, two. Okay. Okay. Go back to. You go back to. Right here. Yeah. What's happening? Is he as close to Jesus as he was? No. no. Is he any closer to the world? No. No. That's how everybody gets deceived. Well, I'm, I'm okay. I don't. I don't do this stuff in the world. I'm okay. The world's getting worse. Right. Yeah, the distance is still there. But what in the world's happened here? Right. Oh, God, teach me somehow. God, teach me somehow that I need to walk this way, this way, and get closer all the time yeah. to Jesus. Yeah. The only way I can do that is not by the willpower, but by understanding the word of God. Amen. Where I can partake. 
mighty nature of my Jesus. Woo! Amen. Amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Thank you, folks. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Well, I don't need to take any more time, but God, you need to work with us. Would you help us today? Lord, we're men and women 